Hello, welcome back to BioClass Bytes. In this video, we are going to talk about the classification of life. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Before Linné proposed his systems of naming and categorizing organisms, it was quite um, confusing uh, to uh, scientists and, and students whenever they talk about organisms because um, as you can see, you know, for every language, you know, they have their own name for a specific organism. For example, for a cat, it's um, Kotka in Bulgarian, uh, Bushi in Klee, um, Nari in, in Papua New Guinea. For dog, it's Hund, it's Inu, it's Kukur, Hundur. And for chicken, we have other names for it based on language, uh, Pilatina, Polo, and uh, others okay so it was quite difficult and quite confusing so imagine a scientist of two of uh, different nationalities and they're talking about an organism but they have different names for that organism so it was really not efficient it was really uh, confusing uh, before Linné. Linnaeus ushered a new era in uh, taxonomy okay so his works Systema Naturae in 1735, Species Plantarum in 1753, and Systema Naturae, um, he revolutionized a modern taxonomy. So the most important thing that he contributed was the standardized naming of organisms, okay? and it's called binomial naming system or binomial nomenclature. So the, the term by here, the, the prefix by here, it, it refers to the two names, two names an organism gets okay in in their scientific name so similar to to us now we have our first name and then we have our last name so in organisms they get two names okay for their scientific name so that was actually an elegant solution to this chaotic and disorganized quite disorganized uh, manner of naming organisms so before Linnaeus, plants and animals were considered separate kingdoms. So now this refers to the taxonomic classification. So, um, so what he did was used uh, he used the the rank of uh, kingdom and used it as a top rank and divide the physical world into plant, animals, uh, plants, animals, and mineral kingdoms. Okay, um, so that was around you know 1700s. Uh, but as advances in microscopy made classification possible, and as we get to learn more about um, organisms, the number of kingdoms increased. So in this unit, okay, for the purpose of discussion, what we will follow would be the sev seven kingdom system of classification. This table shows us how the classification of organisms changed over time. Okay? So in 1735, so this is what Linnaeus proposed, okay? So uh, he proposed that all living organisms are divided into two major kingdoms, uh, vegetabilia, so those are the plant, plants or plant kingdom, and then animalia for animals. So since, you know, again, no, we do not, they did not have yet the microscope during this time, it was not yet uh, commonly used, no? So microscopic organisms are, are not treated or not considered in this classification. In 1866, uh, Haeckel proposed a three-kingdom system, okay, in which he included the microscopic organisms and he created this whole new kingdom, Protista, okay, and he changed the name from Vegetabilia into Plantae. So, this, this was in 1866. In 1925, Shaton pre uh, proposed, uh, so uh, um, after kingdom, he proposed a two-empire kingdom system. So, there are two empires in his classification, prokaryota okay, and then eukaryota. So, if you still remember our lesson on cells, so prokaryotes are organisms who do not possess uh, a, distinct, a distinct nucleus in their cells, while eukaryotes, they, they, um, they have a nucleus in their cells. So, that was his proposal. Um, it changed further. In 1938, Copeland proposed a four-kingdom system wherein he changed the term for prokaryota into monera, and then he kept animalia and plantae, but uh, proposed a different term for protist, uh, protoctista. So in 1938, we had four-kingdom system. In 1969, Whitaker proposed a five-kingdom system in, with the... With the um, with the new uh, uh, discovery of 
um, fungi kingdom okay um, in the past no they used to be uh, categorized under plants but they noticed that they tend to have more similarities than animals than plants and they are mostly saprophot saprophytic uh, they feed on decaying matter so they were given their own kingdom so by 1969 we had five kingdoms monera protista uh, plantae fungi and animalia in 1990 was proposed a three kingdom system okay he 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 a three domain system okay so that's sim quite similar to Shatton's 1925 two empires but here he he um he separated archaea so those are their primitive organisms archaea because they have distinct um, differences from our common bacteria or, or modern day bacteria so he created a, a domain for them domain archaea domain bacteria and then one domain for eukarya in 1998 cavalier smith proposed a six kingdom system wherein he merged these two archaea and bacteria into one kingdom bacteria protozoa but he created another kingdom for chromista so those are um, um, uh, um, organisms that um, that are photosynthetic but they do not possess a, a green pigment chlorophyll so they have other other colors other um, pigments that they use uh, such as green uh, such as blue green they have uh, brown red and um, yellow pigments so he created a whole new kingdom for them so we uh, by 1998 we had bacteria protozoa chromista plantae fungi and animalia now the, the ones that we are going to use um, in this unit would be the one proposed by rogerio in 2015 the seven kingdom system wherein it uh, archaea was still um, treated as one kingdom then bacteria as well protozoa chromista plantae and then another kingdom for fungi and animalia so one two three four five six seven so as of now this is the one that we will follow so as you can see now this is what i've mentioned here as we discover more and more about organisms our understanding on their classification also evolved over time so um who knows now maybe in the future we will have another kingdom system um, possibly more complicated than this we do not know um, so that's why we need to study about organisms so that we will understand them more and classify them better so again for this unit what we will follow will be this the seven kingdom system to learn more about taxonomic classification i require that you watch this video from ricochet science entitled classification of life i'll provide the link in the description below so ricochet science came up with it with this mnemonic device in order for you to remember the order of taxonomic ranks from general to specific so dear king peter came over for good soup okay so d for domain k for kingdom p for phylum c for class o for order f for family g for genus and s for species so as you can see you start off with the biggest um taxon the biggest group domain and then as you go uh lower no it becomes more specific so this one um is the biggest uh, group then followed by the next biggest group smaller and smaller then you go to the smallest taxonomic rank the smallest taxon species okay so this one specifically refers to that organism so um species again is always uh, written and pronounced in plural form always with an s even if you're referring to one uh, group okay so again more most general to the uh, uh, most specific taxonomic rank so dear king peter came over for good soup a given taxonomic rank includes under it less general categories with more specific description of life forms so for example uh, for taxonomic rank family so under it has uh, for family under it you have several uh, genera so that's the plural for genus so uh, so here you have a more specific description of life force uh, life forms okay uh, we've talked about this uh, in that example on leopard and its different taxonomic ranks while above it each rank is classified with a more general category so above family order order has a more general description than family so below it 
more specific, above it, more general classification. Okay? So, that's the reason why it creates this uh, uh, hierarchy, taxonomic hierarchy, because of those, uh, because of these um, concepts. Okay? So, uh, these more, um, less or more general categories of organisms and groups are related to each other through inheritance of traits or features from common ancestors. Now, all of these lessons, all of these um, concepts will make sense when we go to the last unit on the process of evolution. Okay, So, that's why you have to remember all of this when we go to evolution. Now, this is an image of humpback whale with the scientific name Megaptera. Nova, Nova Engliae. So again, this is another example of those uh, taxonomic ranks. So this one, uh, we, are, we are now looking at red fox with the scientific name Vulpes Vulpes. Okay? So it belongs to domain Eukarya, the biggest, most general taxonomic rank. Because here, uh, the, the general characteristic is that they are eukaryotes. They must have a nucleus within their cells. And that, that's quite a general term. A lot of organisms have that. Now, below that, we're, we're specifically talking about kingdom animalia. That's the kingdom the red fox belongs to, kingdom animalia. So those are animals. They cannot make their own food. Therefore, they feed on other organisms. So that's a general characteristic. So we have a lot of king, uh, well, a lot of organisms under this kingdom. Now, which specific group? So, below that, the the, the more specific uh, taxonomic rank is phylum. So, diba, as we go as we go below, um, uh, as we go below or as we go under the taxonomic rank, we are given more and more specific description. So, which type of animals that belongs to phylum corda chordata? Those animals with um, backbone. Okay. So, among all those animals with backbone, there's quite there's uh, so many. You have class mammalia, those animals with um, uh, mammary glands, okay? With mammary glands and usually covered with fur. So you start off with eukaryotes um, who cannot make their own food, so therefore they feed on others. And then eventually they, those are the, those animals with backbone and specifically those animals with mammary glands and covered with fur. So among those animals that are that are covered with fur among, among all those mammals, which are we referring to the order carnivora or those who feed uh, mostly on meat or flesh of other animals. But there's still a lot of carnivores that we have. So we are which which group are we specifically referring to? Family Canidae. Okay, so these are the wolves and their descendants, wolves and foxes. So among those wolves and foxes, we are specifically referring to genus Vulpes. And among those genus uh, Vulpes, we are specifically referring to this species of red fox, Vulpes Vulpes. So you start off with eukaryotes, that's the most general description. Animals, among those animals, eukaryotic animals, you have animals, eukaryotic animals with backbone. Among those eukaryotic animals with backbone, those that are covered with fur and those who, those who possess um, mammary glands. In, uh, and among those Eukaryotic animals with backbone and with fur and mammary glands, those who only eat meat or flesh of other animals. And among those eukaryotes um, that cannot make their own food, so they feed on others with backbone and with um, fur and mammary glands and those who feed on specifically meat, those that belong to the wolves and their, um, and their uh, uh, family. Okay? And among those, those group of, uh, uh, of foxes and specifically specifically among those um, foxes this species vulpes vulpes the red fox so this is what it means no so taxonomic rank below it is more for example for kingdom those that are below it are more specific those that are above it okay are more general in their description now we go to the so We've, we've discussed the Linnaean uh, classification of organisms. Now we go to the uh, binomial nomencl nomenclature, his uh, uh, standardized way of naming organisms. So this is a formal system uh, of naming species of living things by giving each name composed of two parts, by, two, two parts, both of which use Latin grammatical forms. So they are in Latin, although they can be based on words from other languages, but mostly Latin. Some, 
some use Greek, um, but mostly it's Latin. And we have here um, Lama with the scientific name Lama Glama. So the first part of the name, again, it has two names or two parts. The first part of the name identifies the genus to which the species belongs, while the second part identifies the species. So if you, if you remember this uh, diagram, no, uh, the scientific name is derived from these two, uh, two taxonomic rank, the genus and the species. That's why you have vulpes, that's the genus, then vulpes, that's the species name. Same here with Lama. This is the genus name, Lama, and then the species name, Glama. Um, so, for example, humans belong to genus Homo, and within this genus, the species Sapiens. So, our scientific name is Homo sapiens. Okay? So, we've seen a lot of uh, scientific names already. So, this one is an image of Peregrine Falcon, my favorite bird. And it has the scientific name Falco Peregrinus. What comes first is the genus name. It belongs to genus Falco. And its scientific name, uh, species name is Falco Peregrinus. Okay? So when you write this, it's Falco Peregrinus. Similar to, um, to our names, okay? In the Philippines, our species name comes first. Our, our, our first name comes first, followed by our surname. So we just invert that. Similar, I think, to... How other nationalities write their name? I think uh, if I'm, I hope I'm correct. Now for Japanese, Korean, and Chinese, that's how they write their name. Their surname comes first, followed by their first name. So surname first, followed by the first name. So in in animals, in in organisms, um, genus first, followed by the species name. So out of all languages, why did Linnaeus, Linnaeus chose Latin? Okay. Um, so Linnaeus and other scientists used Latin because it was already a dead language. So Latin was the uh, official language of the Roman Empire and around this time, 1700s, there's no more uh, uh, Roman Empire. So Latin is no longer, it's, it's, it's already considered a dead language. It is not spoken by anyone and so, so the meaning will not change over time, okay? Um, so it's a dead language already. Okay, there's no more there's no more civilization that uses Latin in a daily basis. Okay, some can use it in written, but but not in you know normal regular conversation. So that's one of the major reasons. Again, no. So no, since it's already a dead language, no people or nation uses it as an official language. Linnaeus would not insult any country when when he began to name organisms. So he did not insult. Uh, or even offend other countries or show favoritism to other countries. Aside from that, Latin was also used as the language of scholars in Europe in the early, early 19th century in most subjects. So it, it persisted because of that. So uh, the, right, uh, right now, no, our, our, um, we, we mostly use English okay, as our language of, of scholars, but back in the day, it was Latin. So that's one of the reasons why it was chosen. And many other languages have Latin bases, okay, or, or they base their, their modern language from Latin, but do not use all of it. So it will, it will sound familiar, but it will not be used in a daily basis or daily conversation. So these are the four major reasons why Linnaeus chose Latin uh, as the language in naming organisms. Let's do that exercise again in which we identify the, the different taxonomic ranks um, a species belong, uh, belongs to. Okay, so um, example for this would be wolves. Okay, but we have several other uh, different types of wolves of the world. So tundra wolf, Indian wolf, and all that. But for this example, we will be using the uh, scientific name Canis lupus of, of, that spe of this particular species. So uh, Canis lupus belongs to domain eukarya so we have quite many around uh, 4 to 10 million species so because it's quite general you have uh, many organisms belong under it because all of them are eukaryotes they have um, nucleus within their um, uh, cells then then we have um, supergroup opistoconta then kingdom animalia okay um, more or less 1 million 1 million species. So here, these are all eukaryotes that cannot make their own food. So therefore, they feed on others. So as you can see, plants and fungi are no longer present here. Then under kingdom animalia, 
which animals are we referring to? Phylum chordata, okay, or those um, animals with backbone, okay? So around 50,000, 50,000 species here. So as you can see, invertebrates are no longer found here. Insects, you cannot find insects and mollusks anymore. Under phylum chordata, class mammalia, so those are animals with fur and with mammary glands. So there's around 5,000 species here. So as you can see, birds and amphibians, reptiles, and fish are no longer found here. Then under that class carnivora, so those are carnivorous animals. They feed on other animals, They're the meat of other animals. So what remains here are your, are your bears and um, um, felines and your um, wolves and, and dogs and all that. Then below that canidae, so this is the family of dogs and wolves. Then under that genus canis, so those are the group of uh, groups of wolves and dogs. And specifically, which species are we referring to? Canis lupus. Okay. So for this species, Canis lupus, these are all the taxonomic groups it belongs to. From general, most general domain to the most specific species. How about rose? Okay. So uh, the species name for moss rose is Rosa gallica. Uh, so here, these are the different taxonomic rank of this species. So it belongs in Kingdom Plantae. Okay, so all of those, all, all the uh, organisms here are plants. They can perform photosynthesis. They make their own food. They're autotrophs. Now below that, a uh, more specific more, more group is Phylum um, angiospermae. So these are the flowering plants, okay, angiosperms. Then below that, it belongs to class Dicot. Cotyledonae or dicots, okay? those with two cotyledons. Under that class, you have order rosales, so that those are the roses and their allies. Okay? And then under uh, that, you have family ro rosaceae, so that's the rose family. And then genus rosa and then species rosa gallica. So whenever you write scientific names, it includes again both the genus name Rosa and the species name Gallica. So Rosa Gallica, so this is the scientific name for moss rose. How about for humans? Okay, so this is the taxonomic ranks, taxonomic hierarchy of humans. We belong in Kingdom Animalia, Domain Eukarya and Kingdom Animalia. So we are animals. Okay, there's no other, no other uh, kingdom for us to be placed on. Um, followed by subkingdom bilateria, do, do, jutero, juterostomia, phylum corda, cordata, okay, so we have backbone, uh, subphylum vertebrata, intraphylum uh, natostomata, superclass tetrapoda, class mammalia, okay, so these are mammals, we have, we, are, we have hair or fur and then we have mammary glands, then we have infocrasteria, eutheria, order primates, okay, primata. So we are grouped here with other primates, followed by suborder Haplorini, Simiformes, superfamily Homonidae, family hom Hominidae, man-like uh, primates, and great apes. So this is our family, followed by subfamily Homonidae, genus Homo, ho hominoids, and finally our species Homo sapiens. Okay, so this is modern man. So this is our um, species name, Homo sapiens, Homo genus. Uh, Homo sapiens species name. And these are the different taxonomic ranks that we belong to. Now, um, human evolution will be thoroughly discussed in our next unit on evolution. But if you're interested, I recommend that you watch this video from PBS Eons entitled Your Place in the Primate Family Tree. Very interesting. I'll provide the link in the description below. So in this video, they will discuss all of this and our categories so you might want to watch this so again no, um, binomial nomenclature is the standard um, way of naming organisms and again no, the first word the first word is the genus name and the second word is the species name now here are some you know very important details that we have to remember okay it's quite important for biology students to learn this the first part of the name, the genus name, is always capitalized. The genus name is always capitalized, while the species name, the second name, is not capitalized. So you've seen this all over, okay? Um, uh, for example, in the species name of honey badger, 
my favorite um map one of my favorite mammals with scientific name Melivora capensis. You can see that the genus name Melivora starts with a capital M, then the, followed by this uh, species name capensis, which is, is in small letter C. So in in um in binomial nomenclature, in all the examples we've seen, um, the genus name starts with capital letter, while the species name starts with small letter. The second name starts with small letter. Okay? So, when encoded or typewritten, when you type it with a computer, then you print it, okay? Or when you, you, you encode it using a computer, you start off with a capital H, and a capital genus name, then the second letter is not capitalized. And then it has to be italicized, okay? It's it's italicized. It's it's not uh, straight, no? It's slanted to the side. However, so that's when you have to encode or you have to type. However, when it is handwritten, you have to write it on paper. You do not italicize it, but you underline the genus name separately from the species name. Right? The second part is not um, is separately written. So genus name and uh, underline followed by the second part underline. Why right? not italicize? We only italicize it when we are encoding it. So both parts are italicized um, uh, in normal text when encoded or underlined in handwriting. So you see that capital H, capital G, genus name, then small for the second part. When encoded, italicized, but when handwritten, normal handwriting, but underlined separately. Not just one straight uh, line, but you separately underline homo, you separately underline sapiens. The genus name, first part, separately underlined, then the second name, separately underlined. We have to remember this because it's, this is the proper way of writing scientific names, and you can get wrong. Uh, you, you, can, you might get a wrong uh, answer if you do not follow it properly. So in others, so we were clear with that. In, in scientific works, the authority for a binomial name is usually given uh, when it is first mentioned and the date of publication. So this one is high level biology lessons, but you know, it's, it, it, we, might, we might as well mention it. So in zoology, you write the name of the, of the, the one who, who discovered this species and named this species. So most of the time you will see the name Linnaeus because it means that Linnaeus was the one who first published the description of this species followed by the year it was uh, published, 1758. So this is in, in, in some zoology books and this is how an, uh, animal scientific names are written. So, um, so then uh, sometimes you can see the the but the name in open and close parentheses it means that the original name given by Linnaeus for this organism, which is Fringilla domestica, is now considered belonging to a different genus or they have reassigned the organism. Okay, so that's for animals. And plants for botany, usually just the standard abbreviation. Amaranthus retro retroflexus L dot, it means that it was Linnaeus who discovered or who, who published the name of this organism. Um, another example, Hyacinth to this, Italica, L, then followed by Rotham. It means that it was Linnaeus who first identified the species, but it was reclassified or recategorized by Rotham into a different group. Okay? So this one is for higher biology, um, but you know we might as well mention it here. Now we go to systematics. Everything that we have tackled so far, that's dealing with taxonomy, um, naming and categorizing organisms. Now, uh, now we focus on systematics, okay? So with the advent of fields of study such as phylogenetics, cladistics, systematics, the Linnaean system has progressed to a system of modern biological classification, but this time we will be basing on evolutionary relationships between organisms, both living and extinct. So what we study in systematics is the relationship of organisms all throughout life, both living and extinct. So in taxonomy, naming and grouping organisms, but in systematics, evolutionary relationships um, is what's being studied here. Uh, and this is a, an image of my favorite reptile, Komodo dragons 
with the scientific name Varanus commodoensis. Again, italicized when encoded, capital letter for genus name, then small letter for the second part of the name. So systematics or biological systematics is the study of diversification of living forms, both past and present, both living and extinct and the relationship or evolutionary relationships among living things through time. So here, we visualize our relationships using phylogenetic trees, uh, cladograms, and phylogenies. So here, we will look into phylogenetic trees, trees and cladograms. A phylogenetic tree or evolutionary tree is a branching diagram or tree showing the inferred revolutionary relationships among biological species, okay, based on their phylogeny. So those are the similarities and differences in their characteristics. So what's important here is the joining of taxa, or joining of groups in the tree based on their common ancestor. How are they? So how, this shows us how they are related and the, how they are evolved from each other. And this is an image of my one of my favorite flowers, tulips, tulipa sp. By the way, if you only have the genus name and you do not have the, the second part of the name or the complete species name, you can write sp species, okay? And that refers to the genus, uh, to the scientific name of this general group of tulips. Okay? So you, if you see this sp, so it, it's mostly a more general scientific name. So this is an example of a phylogenetic tree showing us, um, uh, showing us of birds and their close relatives. Uh, a dagger indicates extinct lineages. Okay, it's no longer present. So we all know that birds, okay, birds, are actually uh, more more related to dinosaurs than the rest of um, the rest of the um, animal kingdom. Um, so actually, they are most. So when we we say non-avian, non-birds, avian, non-avian dinosaurs. So those are the dinosaurs who cannot fly. But the, the birds that we have right now are actually the descendants of those, or related um uh, rel re relatives of those non-avian dinosaurs. So a phylogenetic tree shows us how they are related to each other. So for example, birds um and theropods theropod dinosaurs all share a common ancestor and their group shared a common ancestor with other dinosaurs and this group of organisms share a common ancestor with crocodiles okay, with other reptiles and this group of crocodiles and dinosaurs and birds all shared a common ancestor with lizards and snakes so this is a phylogenetic tree it shows us how organisms are uh, um, related to each other based on evolution okay, based on their phylogenies okay so so here this node here this part shows us that they shared a common ancestor so common ancestor here common ancestor here common ancestor here common ancestor here now to to visualize and learn more about the classification of life uh, based on their phylogenetic trees i recommend that you watch this from useful uh, charts entitled Evolution and Classification of Life, Single Cell Bacteria to Humans. Very interesting video. I'll provide the link in the description below. Now, this material is from National Geographic uh, entitled The Tree of Life. You can visit it. I'll provide the link in the description below. It's actually a phylogenetic tree that shows us the evolution uh, of relationship among different organisms. So, this one is the phylogenetic tree for animals. It shows us how uh, animals um, are related to each other and how they evolved from a common ancestor. Okay, so again, you know, the nodes shows shows us that they shared a common ancestor. You can visit this page and you can see how today's animal species have diverged over time from their common ancestors. Now, this one is an interactive phylogenetic tree from one zoom. Okay. Um, it's actually quite interesting, quite exciting to look at. The animation is good. It's very detailed. Uh, you can visit it. I'll provide the link in the description below. So in this page, you can just type here the animal or the species or the organism, the scientific name that you want to, to look for. And then it will provide you the taxonomic hierarchy, the, the different um, taxonomic groups it, belong, it belongs to. Okay. So again, link in the description below. 
Another tool uh, that is used in systematics is the cladogram. It is a diagram that shows relations among organisms. So it uses lines that branch off in different directions ending at a clade. So a clade is a group of organisms uh, with a last common ancestor. So this is an example of a cladogram. So this is the cladogram of the three domains of life. So they are all placed here. So this is the clade. And then it shows us below their common ancestors. So it shows us that domain archaea and domain eukarya are closely related or, or they are closer with each other in terms of evolutionary relationship because they share a common ancestor. And their group uh, shares a common ancestor with domain bacteria. Okay, so back in the day, okay, back in the, in, in the past. So it shows that they are more closely related to each other um, and then their group has a common ancestor with domain bacteria. So, um, so this is an example of a, of a cladogram. So this one is a more detailed cladogram of these three domains. So again, it shows us that domain archaea and domain eukarya all share, both share a common ancestor. So they are more closely related with each other. Um, then they, their group shares a common ancestor with domain um, uh, bacteria here. So this one is the most recent uh, common ancestor of all living things. Okay, so one thing for you to, to note uh, to differentiate a cladogram and a phylogenetic tree is that a phylogenetic tree literally looks like a tree. Okay, it has branching off like that, branching off that shows us where the species diverge from each other and these are the nodes of their common ancestor. So phylogenetic tree, they look like uh, trees, they look like um, branches of a tree like this. Okay, so branching off that way. But cladograms, they have this um, fixed line of organisms and then at the bottom, they try to show, cladograms try to show us their common ancestors based on observable traits. Okay, so the branches is formed based on observable traits that are shared by these organisms, okay? by these organisms. These shared characteristics can be indicated by labels or by bars across the branches. So let's take a look at this cladogram of um, green plants. So all these types of um, plants all shared a common ancestor that's capable of photosynthesis. Okay, so this is their um, last common ancestor, all of these organisms. However, uh, carophytes, so these are um, unicellular um, microscopic organisms that are capable of photosynthesis. They, it evolves separately from the rest of the group because all of these groups have a common ancestor that is multicellular. So it means that this group is not uh, multicellular, so they, they are shown here to, to diverge from each other. So uh, still photosynthesis, but this group uh, are now, uh, this big group is now um, multi multicellular or all of them are multicellular. So as we can see another um, uh, split here uh, because this group uh, now uh, reproduced sexually. They had a common ancestor that reproduces sexually. Well, this group does not have that um, ancestor, so they do not reproduce sexually, they reproduce asexually. So those are your liver words. Now another split here. So this group from uh, club mosses up to flowering plants uh, had an, an ancestor with a vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. Well, this group does not. So they, they are shown here to split from each other. Um, then here another split is, is seen. So this group has um, leaves with veins while well, club mosses uh, do not, okay? So they are shown to separate at this point. Uh, so, so at this point, uh, this group uh, had a common ancestor that uses seeds to reproduce, while well, this one, the group of ferns, do not, so they reproduce through spores. So they are shown to split at this point. Then, both of this group uh, uses seeds. However, this group, um, flowering plants, had an ancestor that has flowers. So this one, uh, the group of gymnosperms, do not. So even if they have seeds, they do not have flowers. The seeds are naked and exposed in cones. So they are shown to split here 
at this point then then uh, flowering plants um, uh, this, that is the last group found in this clade okay so this clade uh, cladogram so this is the clade this cladogram shows us how the um, what is their evolutionary relationship with each other based on their common ancestors and those observable traits okay that are usually indicated in labels at the bottom of the cladogram this one is a cladogram that shows evolutionary relationship among uh, several vertebrates, okay, or those organisms with backbone. So all of these organisms, lamprey, sunfish, newt, lizard, bear, and chimpanzee, all shared a common ancestor with a common vertebrate ancestor. But this group evolved differently because they now have a common jawed vertebrate ancestor, so some uh, an ancestor with jaws. Because lampreys do not have jaws, they are known as jawless fish, so they are shown to split from the group here. Um, now at this point, this group, newt, lizard, bear, and chimpanzee, uh, are sh is shown to have a common tetrapod ancestor. And uh, we know that fish, sunfish, do not have uh, tetra. it's not a tetrapod. So when we say tetrapod, tetra four pod feet, four feet or four limbs. And sunfish do not have four limbs, okay? So they are shown to split from this uh, at this point. Now, um, lizard, bear, and chimpanzees um, uh, are shown to have a common amniote ancestor, so um, different from uh, newt, which is an, an amphibian. So when we say amniote, the offspring, the union of the egg cell and sperm cell, the zygote is nourished inside an amniotic sac which um, amphibians, most amphibians do not have because they reproduce asexually, uh, they reproduce sexually through external fertilization. So lizards, uh, bears, and chimpanzees evolved in this way, and uh, newt as an amphibian is shown to diverge at this point. Now, bears and chimpanzees have a common mammal ancestor covered with fur and has mammary gland. So that's why it's shown here to split from the lizard, okay? So which is actually a reptile, so they do not have first and they do not have mammary glands so yeah so that's that's an example of a cladogram of these organisms and then below them it shows us their evolutionary relationship through their common ancestors and observable traits that ends our video i hope you learned something new don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video till next time goodbye